Hi guys, um, I'm a researcher at UCL, and for the past year I've been building this cryptography library, and there's gonna be a disclaimer for this talk. I'm not gonna go deep into the math. The Zcast Foundation have provided some useful workshops that will do that later on, and I only have 20 minutes, and to teach cryptography you need more than 20 minutes. So instead what I wanna do is I wanna leave you with an impression that cryptography can be really useful for smart contracts, if nearly essential as well. But first, what is cryptography? Well, when I talk to non-experts, they tend to say that cryptography is about designing ciphers, i.e. encryption and decryption. But hopefully, as some people in this room know, over the past 30 years and with the rise of the internet, cryptography is so much more. It's about authenticating people on the internet, i.e. your Ethereum account, or endorsing information, i.e. a digital signature, you know, that's authorized your transaction and spend some coins. And even more, it's about building publicly verifiable protocols, where if a group of people run a protocol and I'm not involved, they can send me the transcript and I can have faith, or actually I can be certain that that protocol was run correctly. So as a cryptographer, when you look at Ethereum, you wonder what does Ethereum offer? Well, another goal of cryptography is to minimize trust. We want to remove as much trust from this system as we can. But in every system, there's always a little bit of trust. So when we design a system, sometimes there's a trusted third party. But what's really cool about Ethereum is that a smart contract can be our trusted third party with public state. So the, as, because it has public state and it's a little robot over there, it gossips. It reveals all our secrets. But it never modifies the protocol and it will always faithfully execute our protocol on our behalf. And it's atomic. Either it runs the function or it won't. And using smart contracts, we can build really cool things. But first, let's consider a really simple example. Rock, paper, scissors. And let's consider it where we don't use any cryptography. So our contract is a matchmaking service. If I want to start a game for rock, paper, scissors, I can start a game. Somebody can find my game on the smart contract, and then they can play against me. So Alice with the little Mexican hat, she starts a game, and because we're not using any cryptography, she's going to leak rock. So she'll reveal rock and say, I want to bet five pound, or five dollars in my rock, paper, scissors game. Bob can look at the contract and say, well, Alice just played rock, so, you know, I'm just going to play paper and win, the, and win five dollars. You know, the contract evaluates that, it comes back to say, oh, well, you, you won the ten dollars, you won the prize. So really, we can't actually play rock, paper, scissors in a public setting like a smart contract without using any cryptography. So what do we need to actually build this? We need, a, we need a function where, or we need some cryptography where I can hide my choice, but then I can later reveal my choice, and I cannot change my mind. And we can do this using trivial crypto. And as most people in this room are probably aware of, there's cryptographic hash functions. So if I want to choose rock, I put it through the hash function, I'll get 32 bytes of random data. I'll store that in the contract. And later on, when I reveal rock, the contract will hash it again and compare the result with the output of what it hashed. So that's really cool. And what I also want to add are two really cool features of smart contracts, deposits and refunds. So the idea is that when you start a game, you send a deposit. And then when you finish the game, you get your deposit back. And this will provide a financial incentive for people to finish the game. So let's go back to our little simple example of rock, paper, scissors. Alice will make a choice, so run it through the hash function, and then she'll send the hash of her choice, $5, and that small little deposit. Now Bob comes along, and Bob can look at the contract. He can see that Alice wants to play, but now he can't see her choice. So there's a bit of risk. It could be rock, paper, or scissors. So he'll make a choice, He'll send the hash of his choice, $5 on a deposit, and he'll tell the contract that he wants to play rock, paper, scissors with Alice. Now, in the second round of this protocol, everyone must reveal their choice before time t. If you don't reveal your choice, you forfeit your deposit, and likelihood, the counterparty party will probably automatically win. So, next, Alice will reveal scissors. The contract will evaluate to say that, well, scissors was her commitment, it matches the hash that she gave me. Next, Bob can see that Alice's choice was scissors. So now he has two decisions. A, he aborts the protocol because he's lost. 
or two, he plays the protocol if he wins or loses. Now, because he's left a deposit, he's going to reveal paper, and he's lost the game. But he does this because he wants to get his deposit back. The contract will evaluate this and say, okay, I'm sorry, you know, uh, scissors beats paper. Bob gets his deposit back, and Alice wins and gets $10. Now, to the security experts in the room, as my little disclaimer, you should normally use announce when you do this, but I want to avoid these details because I'm not here to you know, present exact secure protocols, so it's the intuition of why cryptography is useful. So what's really cool about the previous example is that the deposit and refund scheme provided this financial incentive for people to participate. And more, the HOS function provides that ability to hide my choice, but also commit me to my choice in a public setting. What's not really good is that when Alice sends her hash, there's no way to verify that was either rock, paper, or scissors. Alice could have sent Spock, and then later revealed Spock. But in this setting, that doesn't really matter, because if Alice did choose Spock, the contract will say, well, Spock wasn't a, a valid choice, so Bob automatically wins. But what if, we set, what if we have a protocol or an application where a user can't reveal their choice? So all the contract has is encrypted information. And the classic example is e-voting, where we want to maximize uh, voter privacy. So the idea is that uh, you should be able to see that Patrick has cast his vote, but it's encrypted. So you should never be able to see what I voted. And let's imagine we have four encrypted votes, and these are, in st uh, these are stored on the smart contract. And now we want to compute the tally. We should be able to simply add these votes together, and once all the encrypted votes are added together, there'll be some crypto magic, and it will automatically perform the decryption. So then we get the tally that's one yes vote and three no votes. Now in this setting, voters cannot reveal their vote. So we can't do that really nice commit and reveal trick that we did with hash functions. We also need to be confident that every encrypted vote is either yes or no. If we don't have that guarantee, then an attacker could create an encrypted vote in such a way where they change somebody else's vote, they cancel somebody else's vote, or they just vote multiple times. Because remember, these are encrypted votes, and under the hood is all mathematics. They're doing addition, subtraction, multiplication, et cetera, et cetera. So one way to get around this is to use a zero-knowledge proof. And what I can prove to you is that my encrypted vote is either yes or zero. And with this proof, all, and that's the only thing I reveal about this encrypted vote. I don't reveal the vote itself, I just reveal that it's well formed and it satisfies some type of criteria. So now we can build a contract where each voter, they'll do an Elgamal encrypted vote and they'll send that to the contract alongside a one out of two zero knowledge proof that this vote is either yes or no. The contract will accept it and store the encrypted vote. And every single voter will do this then at the end of the election, we can add the votes together and it will leak the tally. Now, if people want to know more about this type of e-voting smart contract, I'll be giving a full talk about it at 10, uh, on Friday morning. So that's just a little advertisement for my talk later this week. But let's consider another application. Let's just say we want to outsource some type of computation. So Alice has this large computation she can't do herself. And now, she finds two different cloud providers, but she doesn't necessarily trust them. So she makes each cloud do the same exact computation, and then if she's given the same result from both clouds, then she has some confidence that the computation was done correctly. So what she wants to do is set up a bounty. So now there's a smart contract out there, and if the contract um, and if the two clouds can prove that they did the same computation and they got the same result the contract will reward the clouds for their work. So what we can do now is use a Peterson commitment. So this is, so this is different than a Haas function. So with a Peterson commitment, we can do some type of computation on it, which is known as a homomorphic encryption. And the idea is that it's computationally binding and it's, informa I can't really pronounce it, information theoretically hiding, but we don't have to worry about those two properties. The idea is that we can do some type of commitment on the final result of the computation. So now each cloud will send their commitment to the contract and that will be stored. And later on, they will reveal and open that commitment to Alice via some private channel. 
Alice can then compare both of the open commitments and she can see. She can see that they've both done the same computation and got the same result and they've both committed to this end result in the contract. Now what Alice needs to do is that Alice needs to convince the contract that both of the clouds did the computation correctly and that they did both indeed commit to the same result. And we can do this using an equality zero knowledge proof. So the idea is that given two Peterson commitments, I can prove to you that they both commit to the same message without revealing what the message is about. So essentially what Alice can do is that she can say, okay, yes, both of the clouds did the work. She sends the robot or smart contract as equality proof. And then the contract will get the two commitments it received from the cloud. It'll run it, and then it will use that as input to the proof. And then the contract will be convinced that both of the clouds did the same work. And then it'll reward the cloud for the hard work. So that's really cool that we can actually do this. Now, of course, in this application, you could argue, well, both of the clouds can collude and, always, and not do the computation, but then get the money from Alice. We're going to ignore that for the security experts, but we have done some work in this area, so if you're interested afterwards, I can talk about it and, uh, offline. But essentially, what I now want to talk about is local crypto.sol. So these cryptographic primitives are implemented in Solidity, and they're available for experiments. So the first three were used for my voting system. The second two were used in that uh, anti-collusion smart contracts I just spoke about. And there's another one that's under review, but I won't go into that too much at the moment. But what would be really cool is that, well, ideally what I wanted to do now, and this is my disclaimer, I wanted to have gas costs of before and after the hard fork, because now Ethereum supports elliptic curve mathematics natively. Unfortunately, I've not managed to get the new opcodes to work. So if someone in the room is very familiar with that, you can talk to me afterwards, and hopefully for Freddy, I can have updated gas costs on how expensive this is. And I'll give you an example. So the one out of two zero knowledge proof before the hard fork would cost 2.5 million gas, which is really expensive considering a, a block only contains 7 million gas. I think it was roughly like three or four dollars or something. Where now that the hard fork's happened, the gas cost should hopefully be in the region of 200, 300,000 gas. But I still need to you know, get experimental results to say, yes, that is actually the real gas cost. And now, I like to finish talking about other pieces of work. So I'm not the only researcher who's been looking at applications of cryptography on the blockchain. And I'm gonna highlight some papers that I thought were really interesting. So one was by Andrew Miller called Decentralized Poker. And the idea is that a group of people can play poker as a smart contract and everything's done using cryptography. So we can ensure that the cards are shuffled correctly and that I have two private cards and we're actually playing this game in a way where everybody can verify that is correct. The second one is by Sarah Meeklejohn, who works with me at UCL. And they have a scheme which is a bit similar to CoinJoin. So everyone can deposit coins in the essential smart contract, and then using ring signatures, they can withdraw their coins back from the contract in such a way where they're hiding in a group. So that's to achieve some type of financial privacy. And it's actually really cool, so I highly recommend reading that one. The second one, or the third one's done by Arthur's group, at ETH Zurich, and the idea is that let's just have a contract, it's a betting contract, and I am betting that Newcastle United is finally going to win the Premier League, which they'll never do. But let's just say I go on the BBC website, and then the BBC confirms that, wow, Newcastle United actually did win the Premier League. I can then prove to the contract that the BBC said that to me, and that's really useful for any Oracle type service. The third or the fourth one is publicly verifiable secret sharing. So this is the Scrape protocol. And the idea is that they designed this scheme to work towards building a publicly verifiable random beacon. And this means that you could have some type of random number on Ethereum every so often. And that's really useful for gambling games and everything else. Uh, we built that in, well, I built that in its solidity, but it's only towards that goal and doesn't achieve it yet. Of course, there's my anonymous voting protocol and the counter collusion contracts that I spoke about just before. So thank you very much for listening to this talk. Before I finish, I have one takeaway message. Cryptography is only one tool in our toolbox as engineers to solve problems. And if you think cryptography can solve your problem alone, then there's a really good quote by Roger Needham, who was a professor at Cambridge, 
in the 80s, 90s, and eventually in the early 2000s. And he said, if you think cryptography can solve your problem, you either don't understand cryptography or you don't understand your problem. Thank you for listening.